hello, this is Simon to me, and I have a feeling he's going to ask me things. <laughs> I welcome you, Ian Carr, to the oh, Simon Timmy oh, podcast. Oh, it's lovely to be here, Simon, <laughs> on your podcast. Oh, well, it's very good to have you. And we're in Sweden together. We're in Sweden together. Where yes. about in Sweden are we? We're in Sundsvall, which is in the northern part of the populated part of Sweden. But if you look at Sweden as a whole, it's actually in the middle. So tell me, where were you born? <laughs> I was born in uh, Bangor General Hospital, North Wales. And did you live in Wales for a long time? I lived in Wales for four years, and I was there at the time that the Beatles came to visit the Maharashi uh, in Bangor. But I was, uh, what was I, two at that time, so I didn't get involved. Oh, right, because of course when I first met you, you were living in Newcastle. I was living in Newcastle when I first met you. And uh, so when you were four, (laughs) did you make your own way up? Yes, I formed a small <laughs> theatre company. I had a toddler's theatre company that I actually organised and, and got funding for, actually. So we were touring all around. The, and I, I finally, um, on my part, as part of that tour, we, we, play, we uh, uh, did a uh, gig in Penrith. And uh, I thought this would be a nice place to live. So I persuaded my parents to move up there. Uh, and there were... Uh, happy to do that because they liked rock climbing which is what they were doing in North Wales so yeah so uh, they lived there and I continued to tour from there with (laughs) performing theatre company toddlers and was guitar your first instrument? no I learned Amazing Grace on the um, what do you call it the harmonica when I was about three I think uh, off my dad Uh, and then I learned I think I learned the streets of Laredo after that off him he taught me then then I was kind of off with music then I uh, sort of felt like I understood it uh, and kept learning more and more tunes on that and I was and I went to when I went to school they let me play uh, mouth organ in the lit, there was a little band that played for hymns like mostly recorders all the girls played recorders uh, and the boys did other things. It was really funny when I think about it. I don't know why all the girls played recorders. But anyway, I got to play my harmonica. Uh, and I had a C harmonica. And it only worked on certain things, but it didn't stop me playing it. And, and I had to find... I kind of had to find the notes that worked. Um, so you don't, you, had, you found little harmonies and things. But I mean, I'm sure it sounded like a bloody racket, but... Uh, kind of made sense to me and nobody told me to stop you know <laughs> it's been always been my basis for playing really do it till somebody tells you to stop so and so when did the guitar happen uh, it happened when I reached my teenage years and um, I graduated at that point to um, a not very good piano accordion uh, I used to play Beatles songs and John Denver songs on the piano recording, and I also played in, like, in a little Cayley band, and uh, and that be- the accordion became a little bit uninteresting when I saw, I suppose I became interested in pop music, and there was bands play, people playing guitars in school, and there was there was a band that there was a band called The Object that played in our school that were really good. They were like a kind of Joy Division, New Order sort of band, which is kind of, when I think about it, it was actually contemporary to Joy Division and New Order. So I I was wondering, they might have been really good, you know. But, uh, and there was a woman called Bridget Upson that played guitar in that. And she's to this day, uh, but she's a professional musician now. She was a brilliant classical guitarist, but she used to play a Fender Les Paul. I thought she was very good. And I wanted to be like her. But there was another fella called Ewan Allinson. Uh, and he played electric guitar. And he had a brilliant band called Crimson Garden. And me and him used to play together. Um, and he he used to go... And I used to go... All weekend, until one weekend. He said, can you... Could you learn to go like that? So I can go. So we did, you know, we had to swap out to learn that. And then I was in a band uh, with him for a bit. And then I got kicked, I actually got kicked out of this band because I couldn't play, um, 
I still can't! Sunshine of your love. How the bloody hell? I couldn't do that, I couldn't do bar chords. And I still can't do bar chords. <laughs> but, um. So then I got kicked out of that and then asked to join another band that he was also in with the same people that was like a kind of jack, a sort of, I don't know, kind of jazz rock and that. I played the Far Pfizer organ and I got kicked out of that as well because I played this Far Pfizer organ and there was, played it at a gig and there was no monitor so I kept asking the fella doing sound to turn it up and he turned it up to the point where I could hear it but of course all <laughs> anybody could hear was this deafening Far Pfizer organ and um <laughs> the, and I remember the, kind of hearing a discussion about the next gig or practice in the car, kind of this whispered discussion. <laughs> That's me kicked out of that band again. <laughs> but not to be put off. I, <laughs> I didn't get where I am today by being put off, by being kicked out of bands. So... Then what, what was your first professional band then? When, when, I suppose, when did you decide to become a professional musician or was that even a thought? Well, I was in a band, I was in a Cayley band playing uh, not very good accordion and then I, so we were doing gigs but that was weird, I sometimes got paid and I sometimes didn't get paid and it was a bit funny. The first actual time I got paid for doing something that I thought was music that I wanted to be doing was in a pizza hut in Newcastle in the big market at lunchtime on a Saturday I think um, and I, I used to go all the way from Penrith on the train to play this gig with my friend Pete uh, and we used to get paid £2.50 each and uh, a pizza and half a pint of lager and I thought it was wonderful I thought, my God, this is actually serious kind of music business. I thought, this is amazing. And we, you know, we got to hang out and we'd play all the time anyway. You know, we didn't uh, do much else. So then that <laughs> persuaded me that I should move to Newcastle. Because uh, I was playing in... You know, I was playing you were in Penrith. I was in time. Penrith. Uh, and, and I was playing in a... This is a, a few years after school, actually. That, or this is kind of late. I think I'd left school, kind of, I don't know. Anyway, I was playing in this band, uh, a rock band, and we used to pub some really good. I Actually, it's funny, I was listening to that the other day and thinking, God, if we'd have actually decided to be a thing and, you, you know, to give, up our, our, <laughs> to give up our... Had we had the confidence to say, let's do this, which we didn't, you know, because you kind of... That was a thing in the 80s. You, everybody kind of... You just assumed it was all not very good you know <laughs> nobody had any kind of get up and go it was just like so everybody was everybody else in the band except me had jobs or electricians and um yeah things like that so so i just went I, I told them i told them i'm going to newcastle and the bass player who was about to get married said i'm coming with you so me and him went and got flat and his girlfriend his fiance nearly killed me and then he moved back to get married to her so anyway uh, but so anyway he, I had this flat in Newcastle and I was playing in the session playing in sessions as much as I could playing Irish music learning how to do that playing all the time on my own I mean not yeah so from what you see uh, up until that point you weren't really playing any folk music at I, all and then suddenly you're in an Irish music session I always loved folk music because my mum and dad used to play me folk play it to me and I had a friend called Neil that uh, who I knew I kind of knew him all of my life Neil Kane he's called and he was a really good guitarist and he used to teach me stuff and play me records he used to play me Planksty records and uh, Bothy Band records and Irish stuff really um, lots of good things so he really uh, you know, so so. It, it, oh, and Jimmy Shand. I've always loved Jimmy Shand. When I was really little, I loved Jimmy Shand, and uh, and I loved the Glasgow Orpheus Choir. Yeah, lovely. Music, great, work, and great choir. Kenneth McKellar and people like that. I loved him. Uh, and um, yeah, so yeah, so I've always been a bit folky, and um, so so yeah, so I, I was playing playing these. Uh, sessions and, and then being in bands I was in a, in a band with 
Joe Schofield and that, and my friend Pete Chaloner and Neil, who I mentioned earlier, um, and we used to do. This was at the time of the miners' strikes. So we used to go and play on picket lines for the miners, and there was and other. We were involved in lots of union stuff, playing benefits and lots of political activity. You know, playing on demos and um, and we made we made tapes. Remember, maybe the first recording I ever did was a a tape for the for members of the uh, Tailor and Garment Workers Union that were striking for union recognition in North Shields. We made possibly the worst tape ever recorded for the for uh, this band. Um, but I, I loved it, I got to play, I was playing electric guitar uh, and uh, there was a great band in Newcastle with Joe and other people called We Don't Want the Peanuts, We Want the Plantation dance band they were called, so they were quite an, uh, quite an inspiration the first time I, and the first time I heard a Swedish tune uh, which was <laughs> They used to do that, so, so I kind of learned that. So that's my first exposure to the music that I do a lot of now. I suppose, I suppose see, we're just kind of gradually moving into doing it with just as your life. Yeah, and there was very little work in the north of England. There was three, mini, three million unemployed, so, you know, and I remember going to careers advice at school and saying, I want to be a musician and... Uh, and you know, it was kind of unheard of, really, certainly there. It just sounded like a dream and saying, OK, I'll join the the Merchant Navy then and then being happy with that. And um, so it wasn't unusual for, for for young people just to be on the dole. That was kind of what was, you know, I mean, I, I know people in Penrith that are still on the dole. You know, they never got on any kind of paid work, you know, got depressed and that was... It was a, it was it wasn't easy times I suppose but but yeah so I was on the dole and I had and I played my guitar and not unfortunately didn't get found out for the little bits of money that I earned then um, but mm. hopefully no not get nobody's going to find me out now I hope there's no snoopers watching <laughs> so it was very little money anyway, I but, mean um, I obviously met you I met you first in nineteen eighty eight. At that point, were you already in the old rope string band? Yeah, that's what I would be would have been doing then, and that would have been, yes, the and we were we ended up touring, doing quite a lot of gigs. It kind of built up. And we built. I remember there being a point where people started to kind of clap like they meant it when we played, and it was like, oh, that was a new feeling, you know, because I mean previously, you know, we weren't very good really, and and we kind of got to this point where. Yeah, when it, it it was having an effect on people, they were like it was kind of a comedy band, you know, uh, not you know, kind of bad bluegrass and and kind of comedy and, yeah. and folk music and uh, and it yeah it, it did get good. So it's interesting though because obviously old uh, old, old rope string band with what again with Pete Challoner and Joe Scarfield. That's right. Yeah. And I mean, you talk about how you weren't very good, but I remember because we so in 1988 was the very first Radio Two Young Trad Award, BBC Radio Two Young Trad Award, and we I remember walking in and meeting you. Now you're saying that no, we weren't very good, but I remember as soon as you played, I go, this guy's amazing. Right. So uh, he'd done a lot of developing quite quick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. You had great uh, technique, and as always, you have got fabulous rhythm. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, what I'm saying is that there was a point that we were out doing gigs, and we weren't very good, really. Uh, you know, it took a uh, while of us doing gigs, and it just being a bloody shambles. You know, but we, you know, we we we'd kind of. You know, I mean, we would always stay up all night practicing and think we were brilliant, and then we would go out and do a gig, and it would be re always be really disappointing for years. 
Yeah. <laughs> Until it got to that point where it's like, oh, that's, that person's enjoying it. And, and actually, you know, it got to a point where people go, whoa! And things, <laughs> oh, you know, that's pretty hell. But, it, you know, it, it wasn't... It didn't come <laughs> off at night. But we, but we didn't get over... You know, it's like anything. It's like we were saying before. It's just work, isn't it? You just have to work. <laughs> You're doing a tune, you know. I think, yeah. It was all an interesting time as well, because obviously also in that 1988 awards was Andy Cutting. Yeah. And Catherine Tickell... Catherine Tickell was... was a, and I remember that night that we did our competition, which we both never won. Uh, congratulations, Lynn Tocker. Lynn Tocker. <laughs> and uh, actually, you were playing that night... With her. With Catherine Tickell. So I just started playing with her, and that was proper professional band and uh, that uh, she had a career and she was looking for a band and she took us on the road for I can't remember how long it is I never know how long anything lasts but could it have been five years could it have been more I'm not sure but we bloody hell you know we went all over the world doing that it was brilliant um, because cause um, Catherine at that point was already a star she, she was had, an established she had she worked did. so hard she had done amazing work for us young yeah. musicians at the time because there was hardly any young musicians no. playing folk music and so when you because that was in the Purcell rooms and she sold out that night in the Queen Elizabeth Hall in London really no which, it would have been the Purcell rooms it would have been was it? It? I, I think it was the person. Anyway, there was loads of people there, and I was yeah. like, I'd never heard of any of you guys at mm. all, so I was amazed. Yeah. Yes, uh, well, you hadn't heard Catherine? No. All oh, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she was really good, and uh, I remember, yeah, very exciting meeting her and getting asked to join that band. It was like, bloody hell. So you were playing uh, with Catherine, and then I, we managed to get together no, in 1990. <laughs> it's in my folk festival, and we made a decision bef to make a record together and Black When did we Crow. make that decision? Was it, did we make it? Well, did, uh, I don't know. Did uh, Jeff Hesloff of Black Crow Records come to us I and say... I think you were going to make a solo record because I think at that point you'd won it. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I'd I won the you, Radio I 2 Young Child yeah. Award yeah. in 1989 and I was going to make a record and then we decided to make it... A, I thought you. Yeah. Were, I think you thought it would sell more copies if you got me on it. <laughs> you fool! Well, I know how well, how little do you know yourself? <laughs> uh, um, so we made that record, Hoots, and we done quite a lot of work when that we came did, out, didn't we? We did. You because were at we, university because, but uh, so we could only tour when when no, everyone else was on holiday. It was always like bank <laughs> holidays, wasn't it? It was always like, oh man. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's good. And so that record was called, called Hoots, but we actually had a, a sound, you know, we did some jazz covers. Yeah, we did Lullaby, Lullaby of Birdland, which, I, yeah, I'd never heard that. It's a, um, yeah, St. Louis Blues and uh, a few other sort of... And we did a, a, my tune, the old rope string band. Yeah. That was the end of the first side when we used to have to decide the first side of records. Yeah, and it's like slightly weak, isn't it? No, it's not. It's no, great. I mean sonically, it got it got weaker at the at the end of the sides. Yeah, possibly. Well, kind anyway. of the grooves. No, I see. All right, you're way above me. Anyway, um, uh, so we did quite a lot of touring, and then but things did fizzle out a little bit. And about 93, 92, 93, I think. I suppose we both had jobs, didn't we? You know, I had me, I was playing with Catherine, um, and you were... It's Simon uh, Toomey or three. Simon Toomey And three. I was moving more towards the jazz thing, because mm. that was what was going on in Edinburgh at the time. Yeah. Very much that. And I was playing with two jazz musicians. Yeah. Doing a lot more writing, actually. Yeah. I mean, there was tons going on in Edinburgh, wasn't there? It must have been... Very exciting place to live. But I was coming up to Edinburgh all the time and doing stuff with other people. I was working with Jim Sutherland at that point, and um, 
So we kept meeting. I remember we did some recording. We did that thing where we were singing. Do you remember that? Well, that's singing? right. Yeah. I never, I never Eddie Kelly's. Too. But I suppose it was, uh, it was because, I mean, as I watched your career, it kind of took off from there because you had like the... a rocket ship, <laughs> wouldn't it? Because you met uh, Karen Tweed. Yeah. And then, obviously, that went into Swap mm -hmm. and the Two Joes mm -hmm. Quartet with uh, Andy Cutting and Chris Woods. Yeah. All through, that would have been the 90s. That would have been the 90s, I think, yeah. Yes. Worked hard during the 90s. Um, so, tell us about, how did Swap come about then? I mean, I love, as I say, I loved Swedish music. I used to play, we used to play bits in, in the old rope string band and Joe Scurfield used to, used to play lots in his kitchen, you know, so I kind of had an idea and I, I was very, I didn't, I couldn't, I could never work out how to play guitar to it, really, and it, but I, I was kind of wondering if it, what I did was, all oh, right, and Joe didn't know, you know, I was like, will this do? Yeah, you know, uh, and um, so kind of, it was very interesting to come to Sweden and meet a real sweet Swedish person and play a tune with her that I knew. Katis Olsen, it was. Uh, so I played a tune with her at the Fallen Festival, which we got a gig with um, with Catherine at the, uh, at the Fallen Folk Festival. I met her and played a tune, and she kind of didn't tell me to stop. <laughs> like I was saying, you just assume, keep going, keep going until somebody tells you to stop, you know, and she kind of looked quite pleased. And then... Um, and then we, through that, we were asked to tour Sweden, so we toured, toured Sweden, uh, and we had, and there was, and during that gig there was another, uh, during that tour there was a gig in Fallon, and, um, and Ola Beckstrom and Karina Normanson were there, and they were there at our sound check, and the, the promoter of that gig said, oh, asked Ola and Karina to play a tune for us. And they did, and um, I, I couldn't believe it. I just wanted to, I just wanted to get in there, you know. And I, because I, I was, I didn't just get my guitar out, you know. It was really complex, really groovy, really. Um, uh, oh, it was amazing! I just, and I heard, my, I kind of heard my a third voice in it, uh, and uh, and later that night we were asked to, a, we went to a party at somebody's house where we were staying, and they were there. And I kind of said, do you fancy getting together and trying something? And I was I was thinking of, I would just go and visit them in Sweden. And then Karen, I told Karen about this in the morning. Who was in? Karen was in the Catherine to Calban. And she took over from Lynn Tucker. And she'd taken over from Lynn Tucker. And I said, and I told her about that. And she said, oh, great, let's get a grant. And, you know, she kind of did the actual... Yeah. Leg work, which I wouldn't have got together. I probably would have just gone and have a ch had a jam. <laughs> but she, you know, and she got us a gig. She got us a gig. I think she even got us a gig at Bloody Celtic Connections. <laughs> it was like Celtic Connections the next year. Uh, would have been a yeah. Um, <laughs> oh God, we've got to, you know. We, this is serious. So there was like loads of uh, loads of rehearsing for that. It was really scary. God, it's amazing that, isn't it? That commitment that she had to do that. Yeah. I don't think it anything would have happened had it been left to me. I <laughs> would have just had a jam, you know, and gone home, you know, <laughs> probably. Uh, right. But yeah, so that you know, we made I mean, four records. And I, I don't know whether this is interesting, but we're editing out. I um, meet people that love swap, and uh, I get and people think. I think people think that we were quite big or something, but the reality of it is that during that whole time that we made all that, all those music, it was like, um, there was nobody would nobody came to see us, you know, <laughs> it would never go down very well. Well, actually, really. all the musicians came to see you. That's right. So all the musicians, which was, you know, not it's not general public. It wasn't really until the the very last year that we were touring that we had we had a really good agent who also did PR for us and he kind of moved it up a bit and it was like at that point it it was like there was general public there was mm. a feeling that that was exciting previous to that it was all like you know one person in Balini House in 
in Inverness and things like that. Yeah. It's all like, oh man, what we're we doing. I remember but people actually, crying in rehearsals because it's like, what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so but, it's really funny to when people come up and have this kind of vision that it was a, that it was Yeah, it I just... Like we were just I remember everyone saying, oh, Swap's coming, and everyone would come out to see the band because we loved it. Everybody mm. loved the band. And there's this crying <laughs> moment. <laughs> Everybody. All these so musicians trying to get in for free. <laughs> Fighting. <laughs> People turning up with axes. There's a bloodbath at the door. So, I mean, so you've got Swap. Is it because of Swap that you decided to move to Sweden? Yeah. Uh, because of coming to Sweden all the time and kind of getting a bit of a a little bit of a life here and meeting other musicians and meeting my wife through them, uh, I met her. She was a friend of the people in Swap, so uh, I think the very first rehearsal we got to hang out with her and uh, yeah, and so uh, ended up uh, decide yeah we were commuting to each other. And uh, and then eventually had yeah decided to move country, so I, yeah I moved here in two thousand and one. And then you find it different. Well, I mean, I was already coming here all the time anyway, so it was just yeah. Uh, although what did happen was that ended up getting more much more work in Great Britain, <laughs> Great Great Britain, in the United Kingdom, in England and Scotland <laughs> <laughs> and Ireland. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you ended up getting lots more work. I ended up getting lots more work uh, in in those countries. Who was that uh, with? Uh, well, that was with Kate Ruby, um, and later on with Eddie Reader and with Heidi Talbot and with John McCusker, and that that was that kind of time. That was that lovely bit of my life working with them. And it, of course, you you now speak fluent Swedish as well. I do. Although I kind of have one word for things that I have three words for in, in English, you know. So, so, yeah, it is fluent, but it's kind of, I suppose, uh, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. I just, it's, just, it's nice seeing you and speaking rubbish. So, uh, do you have a philosophy of music? Is there a thing that you, is there a way that you think it should be? I think, I think there's no rules at all. I think that is the one thing, and I think uh, no, actually no music is better than any anything any. I don't think one tune is better than any other tune because I think what whatever you say, whatever you whatever you play, somebody's going to have a different reaction to it. Some there might be. Some tunes there might be only one person in the world that could possibly be like that could possibly like it, you know, but it it still doesn't mean it's a bad tune, you know. It's it's like that's what I say to my boy. He's quite a sporting boy. He's uh, he's nine and he he loves sporting, but he loves music as well. But he, I think he's kind of applying the rules of sport to music, so <laughs> that's not good music. And that's you know what. Um, but when you, you sit down so with a tune, mm. what are, I suppose, in your philosophy, what are you looking to bring to it? Well, looking to get to the end and, <laughs> and for it to be a complete thing. And it, uh, what do you listen for? If I was to bring a tune to you, like I did today, mm. is there things that you listen to and well, want to add? To what if you bring me a tune? If I yes. So in a band setup. Oh, so if you bring me a tune and I'm and I'm gonna play, um, contribute to it with my guitar, um, try and find a, a harmonic and rhythmic space where my instrument works, where you can hear the tune, and it's quite important to like find something that can be heard. Sometimes you can play stuff with that other instrument and you and you can't hear it and you can't maybe you can't even hear the other instrument you can really like uh, mess things up by just playing the wrong thing or in the wrong octave or whatever so you try and find a space where where you where it, it's a sonically pleasing almost now sonically pleasing than music than harmonically pleasing really 
for me actually it's got to be the it's got to find the right voice in or the bit of the instrument to play on um yeah i don't know what the rules are but i know what it's right you know and you just kind of keep going till it's right i think just mm. keep working on it kind of don't give up till it is you know because actually one of the things i noticed is that you talk about how when you were there with joe and pete how you rehearsed all night yeah. that's still very much a part of you as well because whenever mm. we get together it's more rehearsing than i would do with any other yeah. band that's quite important it's quite important to to go at it and work work hard at it and kind of get knackered you know i almost think that's a part of it you just kind of worked and you can't do it anymore it's like till your fingers are sore i think that's just <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> I still love it. <laughs> so and um, now you are in your fifties. Yeah. Has that changed the way you think, or has that changed? You know. Uh, oh, I can't remember. I don't know. I, I can't remember whether how I used to think really. Um, I mean, it's been a long. It's funny. I mean, I suppose there's a bit more money about. I mean, I'm not. I'm just not skint anymore. That. That changes the way you think. You know, not like, yeah, you know, I still could be bloody skint yet. I, I, I still could be skint again, you know, but I've not been for a while. So that, I think that maybe changes the way you think, and it? Um, but I don't know how, I don't know whether that would change the way. So what is next for you? And Because uh, we haven't mentioned your Ian Carr and the various artist CDs from uh, three or four years ago. Yes, I have a band. It's brilliant. It's got... Um, it's called Ian Carr and the Various Artists, and and it made a record called Who He, which is yellow, and I, I still love it. Uh, and um, and we yeah, and uh, and that that was me and my wife and my friend Stefan, and lots of overdubs, <laughs> and um, and some other people as well. Uh, uh, but that became a live reality when I met Laura Wilkie and Thomas Gibbs and um, James Lindsay as well. And, they, and we went to get, did a gig at Celtic Connections a few years ago. Uh, and it was such a lovely experience working with them. And Maria, uh, my wife, was, was there as well. And the whole thing was just great. I just thought, oh, I've got to keep this going. It was just something amazing about it. So um, we're now about to, next week we'll, we'll be rehearsing for a week and then later in the year if we can, I'm a bit nervous that they're not going to be able to do it, but we're going to be recording a record. Um, so I've been, yeah, uh, been gathering stuff to do on that. <laughs> It's all Beatles covers in E <laughs> and B flat. Well, that's probably better than the record that we nearly made the Ian Carr and Simon Toomey play the blues. <laughs> <laughs> Ian Carr and Simon Toomey play comedy blues. <laughs> it's a good genre. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Ian. But do you remember when we, we did... That was interesting with me and you because we got together a couple of times at, in Newcastle and Edinburgh. worked hard. You know, we had... Kind of good tunes going on, but there was like there was actually a bit of a. It was a bit. You wanted to play free music. You loved free yeah, music. Was, you did, and it was like we we there was a, there'd be long sections where it would we wouldn't decide what to do, and it it kind of. It took bloody fifteen years for, to work out what they were going to be. You know, not that we. We didn't. We kind of left it, didn't we? And then mm -hmm. we got when we got together again. It was like that. Like we found it. old recordings. Yeah, well, on I have cassettes. To you found them because we all found, recorded on the cassettes. cassettes. Yeah. Uh, says uh, e, uh, Inkar and Simon Tuba, new hoops, I think it said on it. Oh, right. Um, so, yeah, and then so we got together on the ferry to Shetland and did that staying up all night thing. And I mean, rehearsed up a whole gig, didn't we, with new stuff from 1998. Yeah. And that, what, what year was that? Mm -hmm. 2010. 2010, yeah. Um, so and, yeah. And it's been great because we've had some lovely times since. We've had some lovely times since and there's more to come. So fantastic. Well, thanks very much, Ian. Thanks for being 
for letting me on your blog. One, two, three. <laughs>